My name is Larry Alford, and I'm going to spend 40 minutes, if I can, just trying to tell you a little bit of what I've learned in the last 30 years of finance and to, uh, to protect people. I left the industry in 2004. I started in 1984, and I became a stockbroker at the age of 24. And I went into the business thinking that that was, uh, that was the cat's meow and, and I was going to do great things. It took me probably five or ten years before I got my head far enough above water that I wasn't drowning anymore, that I was actually dog paddling on the surface. And when I looked around, I found that uh, unfortunately about 80% of the people in my business were slightly abusing their clients, taking advantage of their clients' best interests. And I found it was rather uh, pandemic. It was almost like I was a fireman and I woke up one day realizing that the uh, colleagues in the fire hall were out starting fires at night. And I didn't know what to do about that. I worked pretty hard within my industry to, to create better practices. And uh, it, it became a little too hard to try to push my company to be honest and ethical when there was so much money going in the other direction. So I was a retail stockbroker. That means I dealt with mom and pop investors. Average client size was about a half a million dollars. I had a couple hundred clients. Do the math on that, that means I managed a hundred million dollars for retail people. And they placed their trust in me and I did everything I could to, uh, to live up to that trust. And it really offended me when I saw people doing the opposite. I'm gonna tell you tonight the difference between fraud and theft, and this is what uh, a police officer in Saskatoon told me they teach the commercial crime people. Theft is when something has been taken from you, you know it has been taken from you, and you're unhappy. Fraud, on the other hand, is something that's been taken, is when something has been taken from you, you don't know anything about it, it's been done from a position of trust or authority, and so you're relatively happy because you're unaware of it. And this is the area that my industry is really, really good at. And this is the area that I specialize in, in telling people how to uh, avoid investment malpractice and preaching what I preach. Sorry for the feedback. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is I am going to show you how easy it is for my industry to lie to you. I'm going to show you how we use those lies to skim some of your investment returns. And last, why you can do nothing about this until you learn to protect yourself. Those are pretty bold statements, and uh, I think I'll be able to back it up here. We'll, we'll have questions afterwards, and anybody can put up their hand and, and stop me at any time, and we'll look at this stuff a little closer. The, uh, some of the, uh, the cautions that I'll talk about is that I'm going to talk about things like the Investment Dealers Association. They no longer call themselves the Investment Dealers Association. They changed their name a few years ago to the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. But I can't use that many words in a short sentence, so I'm still going to call them the Investment Dealers Association. I hope you know who I'm referring to. It's the lobby group or the self-regulatory body that the investment dealers put forth, just like the Calgary and Area Automobile Dealers Association. Okay. We're going to look at what goes on behind the curtains. Sometimes I'm going to speak as if I'm an investor, and I'm going to be very indignant and say how, do they, how dare they do that, and then once in a while I'm going to step outside of those shoes, and I'm going to speak as if I'm an investment industry person, which uh, theoretically I am. Although I no longer work or represent any investment firm, I still like to tell people things like how easy it is for <coughs> us to take advantage of you. And when I say it in that connotation, I'm talking about the investment industry as I experienced it. We'll go fast to try to stay on time so I don't keep you here all night. And uh, again, questions at any time. If, if I wish to rob a bank in Canada, I'm subject to the criminal code, and everybody's quite well aware of that. If, on the other hand, a bank wishes to rob or defraud, probably is the better term, every member of this audience and your families and your children, 
they usually get the protection of the Securities Act. And when I say protection, they have their own self-regulatory bodies that administer the Securities Act. I'm speaking sort of of the investment side of the banking industry, not the lending and the uh, visas and mortgages and that kind of thing. I'm talking about stockbrokers and investment dealers. So, you folks have to deal with the criminal code if you do anything wrong. In my industry, we get to deal with the Securities Act, and that works pretty well for us. It, uh, it does some great things. The, the, the thing it does is it has, allows us to come up with a myriad of ways to get an extra couple of percent, one or two or three percent, out of your rightful returns or out of the rightful returns of every Canadian across the country. So we're talking about 30 million people getting one or two or three percent of their rightful returns. And the money adds up to some pretty big dollars. So some people say two percent. I can't even understand how that could be damaging to me. Two percent compounded for 35 years or the sacrifice of 2% is going to cut your investment retirement by half. If you go to any financial website, this one happens to be the Bank of Canada, and you plug in into their investment calculator, there's about three or four numbers you can put in there as to how much money you've got, how much you think it's going to earn, and how many years you're going to let it grow. You plug in $100,000 and you let it grow for 35 years at 7% and it'll tell you that you'll have a million dollars at the end of that time. You go back and cancel out that calculation and put in 5%, just knock it down by 2%. So I really don't care whether they skim an extra 2% out of your return or whether they take an extra 2%, I'm sorry, whether they add 2% to your fees or reduce 2% of your performance. You're going to get hit for about that amount in some cases. And it cuts you down to about a half a million dollars over the same time period. So again, take the picture of 30 million Canadians, all of them working, all of them expecting to retire someday, all of them saving diligently and told to save more, and told to get an RRSP, and then get a tax-free savings account, and then get an investment account, and then get something else, and all being herded into the corrals that we have, the five or six banking, largest banking representatives or investment dealers. And this is what's going to happen to the, to the long-term return on people's money, according to my experience. So, we've got, right off the top, we'll go to one of the experts that says how this is going to happen. This is Keith Ambestier, who is from the University of uh, Toronto, the Rotman School of Business. And he did a study that I have on my website and is in the newspapers and on the web, $25 billion pension haircut. And he looked at what retail investment people pay, that's moms and pops and RSPs and tax-free savings accounts and students and education savings funds, what they pay and what they get in return versus what the smart money gets. What do the large pension funds and institutional investors get on the return? And he says it's a $25 billion haircut for well, approximately 30 million Canadians. So we're talking $1,000 a year for almost every man, woman, and child in Canada that's being skimmed by this haircut, or overcharged. I'm not going to say whether they give you an overcharge or an underperformance, but it's a combination of the two that accomplishes this. So we're in pretty good hands when we've got the University of Toronto maintaining this. Um, it's not even my numbers, and he's saying this is a 3.8% disadvantage in the article. A 3.8% haircut to the retail investment people. When I interviewed with CTV's uh, W5 here a month or two ago about the Calgary Gross Sorensen Ponzi scheme, the producer at W5 used the term fish food to describe retail investment people. He said, you're fish food. Institutional people are smart money, and they're getting a 3.8% advantage to the average retail investment person. That's how overcharged we are in Canada, because we, well, I'll get into why that is. 
I already told you that 2% will cut your money in half over 35 years. Imagine your children's investments and your children's children saving. What is their future retirement going to be like if the banks in Canada or the investment people at the retail level can get 3.8% out of your pockets, of your rightful return? So we're talking about returns that sometimes average 4, 5, 6% on retail mutual funds. If they're getting that much of a discount or a haircut, then are we making any money in this game or is it all simply feeding the largest predators in the country? Uh, another study by some credible people, Harvard Business School, London School of Economics, Georgia Institute of Technology says Canada has the highest mutual fund fees by far. And they go into great detail about how there is uh, I think it's one or one and a half or two percent higher fees in Canada than anywhere else in the world. Far higher than the United States. There is a gouge in Canada that will take, uh, again, it, it, it just takes economic, an economic toll on every man, woman, and child in the country. So again, if you, uh, if you take $100,000 and discount the 2%, you're cutting it in half. I don't know what 3.8% would be, but it's, uh, it's horrific to the average investor in Canada. So what does a retired person do when they found that they've had that kind of financial violence applied to themselves? And I see it all the time. Uh, let's look ahead 30 years now. Let's assume that a person has reached this stage of their life and they find they have a complaint, they finally wake up someday, they meet a person like me that says, wait a second, that's investment malpractice. If you've talked to a financial advisor and they've treated you like they're a financial salesperson, if they've given you a, the bait and switch, hi, I'm your advisor, you give them your money, and then they go, okay, now I'm a commission salesperson. That's, that's fraud, according to people that talk to the SEC. So you go ahead 30 years and you claim there's something wrong here. You go to the Alberta Securities Commission website and they say if the matter relates to an investment industry regulatory organization of Canada, investment dealers, or a mutual fund dealers association, that what you should do is you should contact them directly. Contact the self-regulatory organizations directly. So here's the trick. Here's where the magic comes in on how we use the law to say there's one set of law for those guys and one set of law for the poor retail investor. You've gone to the government crown corporation that's supposed to be protecting the public interest. That's their number one mandate. You've given them a complaint, and the first thing they say to you is, go away. We won't even deal with you. You're a retail investor. You're nothing to the Alberta Securities Commission. You don't pay their fees. You don't pay their salary. They actually dust you off and send you to the self-regulatory organizations that formerly were lobby and trade groups for the investment dealers or the mutual fund dealers. They've changed their name and they've tried to change that costume because they got caught acting as if they were regulators at the same time that they were a lobby group. So they just changed their name and that's, that's where we get from the Investment Dealers Association to the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. They split in two and they made a pretense of fixing that conflict. <clears throat> I don't think they fixed it and clients are still sent to the self-regulatory organizations and they're still given the same kangaroo court runaround with their complaints. I haven't seen it get better at any time yet. Um, in fact, if you're following the banking ombudsman story, the banks, Royal Bank and TD in Canada, are actually trying to move away from the legally charged ombudsman service that, that looks at some kind of customer complaints because the uh, resolution process was too fair for the customers. So they want to fire them and go with their own independently hired ombuds, ombudsman, ombudsperson, whatever the name is. So I'm going to look at a couple of different securities commissions. When I refer to the OSC, I'm talking Ontario Securities Commission. It's the same as the Alberta, same as the Manitoba, Saskatchewan. There's 12 or 13 of them across the country. Let's catch them in a lie. 
Shall we? Let's catch the regulators, the people who work for you, lying to you. And let's see what it looks like. Here's what the OSC says to Pamela Reeve in a complaint she made. Um, the process is that the investment dealer have the authority in the jurisdiction over its members to enforce the Ontario securities law. See, I didn't see that in the legislation. I didn't see any time that the members of the legislature gave a lobby group authority to enforce the law. I thought the law was applied to the Securities Commission. But no, they actually say there are no provisions to circumvent this process, and so the OSC is unable to consider your request for a regulatory review of this matter. Go away. You're dismissed. They won't even deal with a member of the public. And this is a crown corporation talking about your money. So the investment dealers go to the government and in uh, November 1998, Mr. Joe Oliver, talking to a Senate Standing Committee on Banking, Trade and Finance, says the IDA is Canada's only national entity with delegated responsibility for securities regulation and investor protection. That's a bald-faced lie. And he's speaking to a standing committee in Ottawa. And he's now a cabinet minister in Ottawa. <laughs> And I find that really unusual, that he would go to Ottawa and tell a tale like that when it's not true. Go a little bit further and we'll hear what the National Post had to say from Brian Awad, an ex-IDA legal counsel. 1999, he said the IDA is a private organization and could set its own rules. We're not an arm of the Securities Commission. We're not acting as an agency or a delegate of the Securities Commission. So who's telling us the truth here, do you think? The guy who's out trying to be in cabinet, trying to speak on behalf of the self-regulatory organization there, or the legal counsel speaking here. Here's what the IDA says when uh, Chris Morgus, who's a property guy in Toronto, took his investment <coughs> dealer to court, and he ended up challenging the Investment Dealers Association in court saying, Okay, let me get this straight. You're the regulatory body, and you're supposed to protect me, so therefore I'm going to hold you accountable. So they defended themselves, and they said, we're well, actually only an unincorporated voluntary association of dealers, and uh, we owe no duty of care to the public whatsoever. So when someone actually stepped forth and challenged them on their bull, and they had to, challenge, they had to defend that in court, Chris Morgus versus Thompson, Kernigan and Company, they, they tell a completely different tale about your money and how they protect it or they don't protect it and who they protect. Uh, Senior Vice President of Member Regulation talking in the National Post 2004, first let's get the facts straight. Governments do not delegate securities compliance. Uh, they do registration of brokers. And the IDA, the investment dealers, can discipline brokers if they don't have their continuing education <coughs> credits or their some kind of uh, compliance stuff. They don't do securities law. But the Securities Commission is acting like the night watchman is asleep at the switch, sending these people out to protect the public. These people are actually the creditors, the self-regulatory organization. Self-regulation is decriminalization. And we've seen that now throughout the world. It's coming home to roost. So we've got a number of conflicting statements here, and we know what the actual practice is. These clips, by the way, are all on a website called investorvoice.ca, uh, and there's a lot more where that came from on this site. But it's a, it's a treasure trove of information about what the securities commissions and the regulators say they do, and then what they actually go out and do to the public. Because they're two different things. They don't, uh, they don't walk the talk. <clears throat> so we're back to what the Alberta Securities Sh Commission said. You should contact these, direct these uh, organizations directly. They've sent people away, and they are the legislative body in Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, etc. It's charged with enforcing securities law, and yet they don't do it for you. It's, uh, it's tricky. Here's the ingredients, and I gave this uh, presentation to a, a committee in Ottawa when I was uh, testifying there as a witness. 
And I said there are some perfect ingredients in place in Canada to, to commit the perfect crime. Absolute great ingredients. And here's what I think they are after 30, 40 years of, 30 years of studying them. The first ingredient is that we don't have police come after us with the criminal code. Remember, we have our own Securities Act, and we have our own securities regulators. So we've got our own police force, which is really nice if you're an investment dealer and you're dealing in billions of dollars. It is so nice not to have to deal with these guys, because they've got guns and handcuffs. They deal with street people and protesters and uh, average everyday people that speak up and I won't even go down that road. So we have our own police force. Number two is we pay our own police force. 100% of the salaries of the Alberta Securities Commission people are paid by fees uh, on regulations and uh, enforcement and application fees. Just like the motor vehicle branch, you walk in there now and get a license, they charge you a fee. The Securities Commission is 100% paid by what they can charge to the investment industry. So they become rather beholden to the investment industry after a time, unlike these guys who are a taxpayer-funded police agency. They don't collect their pay from people that are expected to police. The uh, third ingredient is we pay them at least triple, possibly quadruple, what they would earn in this role. I don't know what a policeman earns. I know prosecutors at $102,000 uh, Securities Commission people are up in the 150 range. There are 90 lawyers at the Ontario Securities Commission alone who I'm told make more money than the president of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. <coughs> 90 in one province. In the Alberta Securities Commission, Bill Rice has paid about a half a million dollars a year. In Ontario, it's about $700,000 a year. These people aren't employees of kings. Um, fourth ingredient is that uh, to create the perfect crime is when it comes time for the RCMP to get involved in the largest matters. There's something called the RCMP Integrated Market Enforcement Team. And we happen to have Securities Commission paid people lent to the RCMP Integrated Market Enforcement Team Joint Management Committees and they, had, they helped them on large-scale crimes on the investment industry side of things. So we got a person who not as independent, not as paid by the taxpayer, we got a person who we pick, we choose, we appoint them at times at the higher levels, and we pay them six-figure salaries to do our bidding, and they're the guys that are on the inside with the RCMP helping the RCMP. Is it any wonder that the RCMP have only made five prosecutions in eight years at the high end of the scale? They got these guys helping them. That's ingredient number four. Uh, let's see, what's next here? I know there's another ingredient out there. It'll come to me. So what we have is we have an incestuous web of self-regulation and loyalties and people who pay other people in the industry to not protect the public, but to actually protect Bay Street. And it's like the, uh, the best reputation protection system in the business. It's better than the tobacco industry of the 1950s. If you can remember when smoking was good for you. Someone told me the other day they had uh, someone in their family had diabetes and they had to lose some weight and their doctor actually prescribed that she start smoking to help her in her weight loss many, many years back. But I digress. The tobacco industry had the best reputation protection system in the business. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was asked, or the LA Times were asked, how come Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor was able to get away with so much for so long? And they said he had a very vast and diverse reputation protection system. Lawyers, friends, media people, people they could tell him. <coughs> this industry has the best. The money industry has the best in the world reputation protection system. We have enough money to own everybody within reach. We can own the politicians, we can own the regulators, we can own the self-regulators, we can even appoint 20 new self-regulators tomorrow if we think it'll help us. And we can buy them all. We can pay them all six-figure salaries. Paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions is nothing when we can steal trillions. 
And all we have to have is this reputation protection system surrounding us. Uh, Vancouver Sun, the Mounties stock market fraud squad is a disaster. Yes, it is a disaster. Uh, and it is a disaster by design, is what I'm going to say. They would disagree with that, and I'm probably exaggerating. But let me explain. The Mounties stock market fraud squad, the integrated market enforcement team, these are the guys that I already told you, have members of the securities industry, regulatory organizations on their joint management committees. I found out the other day, I was just looking something up when I was interviewed, when I, the day before I was going to interview with an inspector from Toronto who was flying out to Lethbridge, where I live, to interview me. Um, I looked it up on the internet, something came into my brain, I looked up how much we pay the police in Lethbridge. Turns out that the city of Lethbridge has more money in their budget for policing, my town, 78,000 people, than these guys have for all of Canada. So get the picture in your mind of all the crime of policing in Canada. According to the government of Canada, we spend $6 billion on it, policing every community in the country. And in this area, the highest economic crimes, we spend $17 million. $17 million there, $6 billion to catch ordinary automobile thefts, muggings, all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to maintain that in my research in breach of trust, the unique violence of white collar crime, is that my industry can do as much crime every year, as much financial damage as every other crime in the country combined. Every single one. We looked earlier at Keith Ambashir's study, University of Toronto said we're taking a $25 billion haircut just on our pension investments, just on your RSPs, your RIFs, your tax-free savings accounts. $25 billion being skimmed out of that every year. All the crime in the country, according to Stats Canada, is somewhere in the $40, $50, $60 $60000000000 billion range. So they've got half of it covered just on your mutual fund accounts. Half of all the crime in Canada. And we spent $17 million on it. It's like um, $6 billion on regular policing, $6 billion on a $60 billion total, let's say. I could be out on that 10 or 20%. That's 10%, 10 cents on every crime dollar in damages in Canada. But these guys, for financial crime, we spend 17 million on that same 60 billion. It is a fraction of a hundredth of a percent that we spend on catching high value criminals. So that is why when somebody says there's a set of laws for the rich and a set of laws for everybody else, it's not entirely true. The laws here, because I hold it in my hand, what they have that's special for the rich and that everybody else doesn't have is enforcement. We enforce the laws for poor people and middle class people and you people. But we ignore the laws at the top. And they have the discretion to do that. Just like a policeman has the discretion to, to let your speeding ticket go and say have a nice day, the police have the same ability to do that with billion dollar criminals, trusted criminals, and it happens all the time. Here's an interesting letter from the RCMP, Craig Hannaford, uh, Integrated Market Enforcement Team in Toronto. It's a couple of years old, I think they've smartened up on this, but on a billion dollar crime where a gentleman from Red Deer ended up committing suicide and complaints were made to the Integrated Market Enforcement Team by experts across the country, he said, unless the matters you are concerned about are referred to the RCMP through one of our participating agencies, the OSC, the IDA, the mutual fund dealers, etc., it will not be considered. That's a go to hell if I've ever seen one from an RCMP officer. So a billion dollar crime, we're going to ignore that. Speed on, gentlemen, have a nice day, is what they say to uh, rich people. Canadian Business Mags, Magazine, September 2007, I think. Former RCMP uh, integrated market enforcement people saying, now retired, out of the forge, saying, this is a good country for crooks. In the article it says, you have to understand there's two sets of laws, one for the rich and one for the rest. And that's 
Funny, I just read that in the Toronto Sun last week, and I couldn't believe it came out the Sun. But it's been uh, it's been years that people have been saying this with no action. This is the number of convictions in the United States by the uh, President's multi-agency task force. Over a five-year period up to 2007, they caught 1,236 people, CEOs, um, chief financial officers, corporate councils, and 129 vice presidents. Let's go to Canada for the same time period. They prosecuted Michael Lee Mitten. He had uh, a serial fraud artist long known to police he had racked up at least 105 convictions previously. They found a guy and they held him up to say, look what we caught. And I am standing here telling you that there's, there is a billion dollars a week that the people at the top of the economic food chain in Canada are getting to take advantage of everyone's productivity, everyone's labor, and they get away with it. Because the police don't enforce the laws. There is no effective enforcement at the high end of the scale. Let's go, let's go beyond and say that it gets better. I said there was another ingredient to creating the perfect crime. Another one of those secret ingredients, and I was at about four, if anybody, was it four I was at? Yeah. Four or five? Let's go to number five. Imagine if you wanted to commit the perfect crime, put as much money in your pocket as you could, so, geez, I'm saying ingredient number six here. I can't even keep track of my own ingredients, but you'll have to forgive me. What if you could go to the people who police you and ask for permission to violate the law? This is where it gets really good. Imagine you're going to now go, because you've got a product that you want to sell or a piece of investment advice that you want to give or a proprietary mutual fund that you want to push on all your clients instead of maybe the best mutual fund you want to give them the house brand. So you want to give all your clients some kind of um, biased, conflicted, slightly fraudulent advice. Here, take this. It's good for you. Imagine a doctor doing that, giving you his own medicine instead of a drug company's medicine. So what, what does the uh, industry do when they have that kind of dilemma? They go and they apply for something called an exemption order. And if you go to the Securities Commission website and type in exemption orders, you'll come up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Here's the Manitoba Securities Commission. Pages 104 is just the, the table of contents. Single spaced, 20 exemptions. Some of them are orders. Order, uh, cease trade over here, do this over there. But I assure you there's, there's got to be a thousand applications and exemptive relief permissions granted here to their investment friends, people that pay them fees, people that make sure that they get $500,000 salaries to let them have permission to violate the law as part of that, uh, that order. So the exemptions are... CIBC, World Markets, Goldman Sachs, <coughs> Bloomberg. Uh, I go to the Securities Commission and I say, now why would you let someone have permission to violate the law in Canada? And what public interest did it serve? Because it has to serve a public interest. Excuse me, that's part of the test they have to meet. And if there is a public interest, why is it done in secret? Why is there no notice given to you or your governments? or the public who are buying this investment or taking this advice? Their answer is absolutely nothing. They will not speak to it. So if, if these people can get away with actually violating the laws, and the laws aren't enforced, so they can do about a billion dollars worth of damage a week in Canada, and then if the, if the laws, if they think the law is ever going to come back to bite them, they go and get permission so that they have a rubber stamp that says, it's okay, I have permission to violate that law on that date to sell you that investment product. I'm covered. I'm good. You can't touch me. That's how we work in Canada. Uh, next, what if our government became the prey? I told you I was a retail investment person. I dealt with mom and pops, average account size, $500,000. I was indignant when I saw retail, other retail investment salespeople who were churning 
the clients, taking um, elderly, vulnerable, trusting, believing individuals and saying, well, this is okay, we're bank people, we are, we're, we're your financial advisor, do this. And they were delivering, delivering commission sales of products instead of advice. I didn't find out until 20 years after, I'm sorry, I didn't find out the entire 20 years I worked in the industry, I didn't find out that my license category at the Alberta Securities Commission said salesperson on it, it didn't say advisor. I didn't find out that the banks get to use the word advisor under a legal exemption, under having permission to violate the requirements of an advisor to use the name advisor. It is as pure bait and switch as anything I can possibly imagine. But I started to say, what if the government's the prey? My experience until about 2004 when I left the industry in some disgust was of stockbrokers churning their clients and earning millions of dollars of extra amounts and putting them into the highest cost funds, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, I was indignant at that. And I, I made a film and I put together a website and I ranted about it saying, it's not proper. And I thought I'd seen it all. <laughs> Until about 2007 or 8, in the real estate market, the bubble burst, and we found that, uh, that every government I could find, including my own city of Lethbridge, the provincial government, the federal government, were buying, the, the governments were being the targets of institutional brokers at the high end, the guys who wore a lot more expensive suits than I could wear and drove a lot more expensive vehicles. And they would walk into the finance minister of the province of Alberta and say, I think you should buy this product or I think you should do that. So if, if the retail broker was preying on an elderly widow, let's say, living alone, sitting on $10 million that her husband left her or that her husband had passed away and left her to look after an entire life's work, she's looking after it in some, and the retail investment brokers are circling this lady trying to get her attention and deal with her money. Imagine, imagine that happening at, the government, happening at the government level. Imagine institutional brokers trying to sell faulty product or defective stuff or just trying to get the money out of your city government, your provincial government, federal government. On the news on the way up here, I heard that the city, the school district of Minneapolis Minnesota was out $150 million from uh, toxic investment, subprime mortgage stuff. So some really smart character walked in there just like Goldman Sachs walked into Iceland, just like they walked into Greece, and sold the government on a slick, slick investment to get them another six one hundredths of a point or something. And that's what I've seen. So instead of million dollar crimes that I saw at the retail level, I'm now seeing billion dollar crimes. And instead of people only being vulnerable, if you walk in and talk to a broker, every person in Canada or North America, perhaps the world, is now vulnerable to these people who are above the law. The law doesn't get enforced to them, and if they really need to, they get an exemption to the law, and they can get away with anything. So that's, that's what I've seen, and that's how I think this Occupy movement is, I think people are starting to get aware of that. I'm still speaking to pretty small audiences in the scheme of things, but people around the world are starting to cotton on to, hey, the money has disappeared. It's gone somewhere. Somebody has taken it. And they're starting to figure out who. And I'd like to tell them how <laughs> this happens. I wrote a letter to um, Iris Evans, and I asked her about the exemptions. And she wrote back saying that similar exemptions were granted to approximately 20 issuers of commercial paper. And she wouldn't answer a single question of what public interest, and if there is a public interest, why would you do it in secret? Why is there no public notice? And why, for instance, you'll get more notice if your neighbor's gonna build a garage too close to your fence than you would deserve if you were gonna put your pension fund, your municipal tax money, or your RSP into a completely toxic investment that's gonna blow up on. You can't sell toxic TVs that blow up on your on people in their homes. But we get to do it in the financial industry all the time. 
and we get to turn around and say, sorry, the market uh, went down. Not my fault. You took the risk. You knew what you were doing. Uh -uh. They've started selling stuff that they know in advance is garbage. They started doing what the Chinese did with drywall and infant formula. They started packaging up the least expensive crap they can and just pushing it out to other people. And we are seeing that worldwide. So the Alberta Minister of Finance has no comment. The, uh, the finance minister after her, Ted Morton, has absolutely no comment. Claims that Iris Evans answered every single question that could be answered on the matter. And he will not be, will not be responding to further correspondence. Thank you very much. Your questions have been answered. I'm sorry. No questions were answered. Not one. And that is on the website investoradvocates.ca, which has a number of topics, everything on how to, from how to get your money back, to prosecute Wall Street, to the tricks of the trade, you know, how to tell whether your investment advisor is an advisor or whether he's a salesperson. There's about 40 or 50 topics on there. But it's basically everything that I think I can regurgitate towards people and what I learned over 30 years. Here's the tricks of the trick. Here's what they do. It's free. It's available to anyone. I would like everyone in Canada to be aware of these predatory practices. I feel slightly responsible, although I am not. Uh, that was my industry. That was my career. And, and like I mentioned at the beginning, if I was a firefighter going into work at a new fire hall, finding out that 80% of everyone around me was out lighting fires at night to get more overtime. What kind of a bind does that put me in? What am I supposed to do with that? Am I supposed to join that or am I supposed to report that? And if I report that, what's going to happen to me? I can tell you what happened to me. It's in my, it's in my film, Breach of Trust. This woman uh, took her own life. Her sister is here in Calgary. She bought some of those toxic investments. She's one of uh, two or three people that killed themselves after having placed their nest egg into subprime mortgages investments and finding out that it was gone. Poof, sorry, it's gone. Um, this is a page which I believe is on my website. It's certainly on the Securities Commission's website. This is just a signature page of a legal exemption. So I gave you, a, I gave you a, an example. I said there's probably a thousand legal exemption applications in that document. You can go on the website and look up every single one. You can dig into why Goldman Sachs, for instance, would need a legal exemption to sell anything in Alberta. I want to know why. You can look it up. So here's a good one. Susan Wolberg Jenna was the Vice Chairman of the Ontario Securities Commission. <coughs> and she signed a legal exemption for one of the ABCP products, subprime mortgage products, that eventually collapsed, sending people like this to an early grave and the economy in the world down the tubes. She was at the time making $400,000 at the Ontario Securities Commission as a Vice Chairperson. Shortly after she granted this exemption, she moved to the Investment Regulatory Organization of Canada, the Investment Dealers Trade Group. Trade Group, Lobby Group, Regulation Group, there's two different angles there. So the first thing she did, OSC veteran picked the lead new regulatory group. She's going to take charge of this freshly merged investing watchdog. And the first thing she did is a report that she put out well, she said that most dealers didn't understand asset-backed commercial paper. They didn't know what they were selling. So she's kind of made a chastising comment, like, okay, you guys, that wasn't really good stuff you did. And that was it. Done. Finished. No sanctions at this point. No fines, no investigation, no nothing. I would want to know why she signed giving them legal permission to sell something that didn't meet our law, that didn't have the proper rating requirements, and what in the world were we allowing that to be put into our economic food chain for our school divisions to buy, our municipalities, our pension plans, 
our teachers' pension plans, our public service pension plan, our Alberta Treasury Grant, our <coughs> University of Calgary. What were they thinking to give permission to violate the law? I believe they were thinking about their six-figure salary that is paid for by their friends who make application, can we please violate the law with these particular products? The processes they follow are hollow. The paperwork and the answers they provide when questioned are non-existent. I believe it's a, it's a criminal violation of the public trust. Breach of trust, section 122 of the criminal code. I don't know if I'll get to deal with that aspect of it someday, but I believe they're a criminal violation of all Canadians when they do this kind of thing. And they do it in secret. And I know for sure that secrets are one of the best tools of abusers. If you want to get away with abuse, keep secrets. The, uh, the solution that I'd like to see is I would like to see uh, Occupy Wall Street go to prosecute Wall Street. Prosecute public servants who do not act in the public interest. Uh, stand up to them and say, I'm sorry, but you have an obligation to look out for the public interest and you have failed in this case and this case and this case and that's a criminal violation and formerly we don't enforce that kind of stuff but now I think we will and that's going to take voices and that's going to take people and it's going to take a little bit of yelling and screaming and kicking to say we never used to enforce this stuff because you're such nice people and you're so trustworthy and you're the premier or you're the finance minister or you're a banker so we trust you, you're respectable no, I, I disagree. I think the whole world's waking up to the, to the fact that our public servants have become predators. Bill Block at the University of Kansas, Surrey, Kansas City says our public servants, our financial servants have become financial predators. And I think our public servants are doing some of the same thing and I think it's quite obvious I don't have to sell that story too hard anymore. But believe me, when I said this kind of stuff four or five years ago, before the uh, real estate market collapsed and before a lot of things happened. That, was, that wasn't a very welcome statement or well understood. I believe civil actions need to take place against some of these people. I do not believe they have immunity. They, they have general immunity if they do their job to a, a decent standard. And we've got people in the room who are better legal experts than I am. But I have seen a number of legal cases where if they act with negligence, or gross negligence, negligence being the minimum failure to do their job, gross negligence being getting a little bit serious, or conscious wrongdoing, meaning they're, they're real bastards at the top of their regulatory organization or whatever their public service position happens to be, they lose their immunity from prosecution. They lose their immunity from civil action. I think people who lost money with the Alberta Securities Commission <coughs> should be concrete equities people, Wall Street people, thousands of people should be going to the Securities Commission, suing them, getting their money back, suing them for gross negligence, asking for the documents, the lawsuit process has a discovery process where you provide me with these documents, you ask, answer me these questions, whether they help your case or hurt it, I want to see what you've done in this case. Ask the Securities Commission. They won't say a word. They haven't got anything. I'm certain the shredders are running tonight, and I'm certain they're making up <laughs> documents because somebody like me is even saying that. But I'm certain that someone's going to beat them at their own game. They're one of the, the most inept organizations that I've run across. Um, who is it? Uh, Steven Jaroslawski, Jaroslawski Capital. He's a billionaire in Canada, one of the smartest 80-year-old men in Canada about money, says that the securities commissions do the square root of nothing. And he's quite correct. They are there as a paid reputation protection system to people who want to break financial laws to hurt all of you. They're paid to act as bodyguards for the uh, fraud artists. So civil actions, if, if a person can't afford to sue such an organization, then I think a class action would be appropriate. If you can find a lawyer in Alberta that will do it, it's difficult. I'm still looking. I've talked to a half a dozen Calgary firms and they're, mm, no. uh, they have some 
fairly high conflicts of interest as far as going after a government agent. I would even like to see 100 people walk up to the courthouse and file small claims actions. Even if it doesn't even come close to covering your losses, there is a message to be delivered to public servants who screw the public. The message is that you shouldn't be doing that and that we're going to hold you accountable, even if it's for a dollar. Even if it's for the maximum at the small claims, $25,000. I think we should be doing it every time they sell out the public interest. So I think there are things that people can do, ordinary people at the grassroots, and I haven't put a thing in here. Oh, private criminal charges. Every single member of Canada can walk into a Justice of the Peace, and they can look it up in this criminal code book, and I found it in the law library in Lethbridge. It's called Laying in Information. It's, uh, I understand it to be exactly the same as walking up to a policeman and saying, I just saw that guy steal a car. You're giving in information. Instead of to a policeman in this case, you're going straight to the courts and you're bypassing the police. Because what the police do in Canada is they say, sorry ma'am, that's not my business. You better talk to the Securities Commission. And what do the Securities Commission do? Sorry ma'am, that's not our business. You better talk to the investment dealers. And what do they do? And the walls are everywhere. And even if you get to an RCMP case, the Integrated Market Enforcement Team, as I've shown you, they have securities industry people inside joint management committees. And the largest case in Canada, $32 billion gone out of Canadian pockets. Ontario Securities Commission gave them the exemptions and the Alberta and whomever. They gave them permission to break the laws to sell this crap. But we knew it was crap or it wouldn't have needed permission to break our laws, and when the RCMP investigated it, guess who they had helping them? They had a member of the Ontario Securities Commission earning three or four hundred thousand dollars on loan to the RCMP that helped them write their report that closed this file. Thirty-two billion dollars. I started out showing you twenty-five billion a year from mutual funds or pension abuse fees from Keith and Bashir, that $25 billion pension haircut. So let's take $25 billion a year, add the $10 billion a year that Columbia University study said that 13 securities commissions cost us in additional overhead and burdens. Now I'm at 35. Here was 32 with one particular exemption. Nortel was 366 billion. I haven't mentioned BREEX, I haven't mentioned Income Trust, I haven't mentioned any of the specific invent, uh, investments, it is billions and billions and billions of dollars every year. It gets, it gets gleaned out of the fields of Canada, like five combines going down the fields on a fall day, cleaning the fields. That's what I see. When I see five or six combines going down the fields, I love it. But I, it reminds me of the banks in Canada, just completely vacuuming up the net worth of Canadians, and doing it above the law. I said at the outset that I'm going to tell you how easy it is to lie to you about money. So I'm your regulator, but I'm not going to help you, but he's your regulator, and he's in charge of the Securities Commission. We get to make this stuff up as we go along. No one's looking out for us. There is no police that are above us. There's no judges. When Auditor Fred Dunn wished to audit the, uh, the Alberta Securities Commission, they told him to go piss up a rope. They spent a million dollars on lawyers in Calgary to say you had no ability to audit the Alberta Securities Commission. So there is nobody above this. We can tell you anything we like and we can change it in a week if we like. And we can even tell you that a decision is not a decision if we like. It's in the papers. What we do with those lies to skim from your investment returns. Um, the investoradvocates.ca covers all of the tricks of the trade that I watched happen in the investment industry. The ones that get that additional one, two, three percent from all of your investment accounts. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the millions and millions and millions of dollars that I saw at the retail level. As you can see, we're now skimming your investments your tax dollars. We're ripping off your government's money. 
we're taking $30 million out of the city of Lethbridge, which was 47, no, I'm sorry, 40% of the tax revenue for one year that they put in these three magic beans investments that Iris Evans let them sell. The Alberta Treasury Branch put 47% of every dime on deposit into those investments. And just about bankrupted the Treasury Branch if it were not for your money bailing them out. And on that note, I have to add one thing before I wrap up here. The nice thing about uh, when institutional brokers start to rip off governments, I'll do two things, is that governments don't tell. When they lose a billion dollars, they keep their lips sealed because they do not wish to appear stupid and inept. And they don't want the public to know, hey, I just lost a billion dollars of your money. So they're the perfect victim. I mean, in the retail game, the really bad stockbrokers used to find an 80-year-old widowed lady with a lot of money and slight dementia onset and no children within a thousand miles of her. And they would spin that lady's account for hundreds of thousands of dollars of commissions. I watched it happen. Imagine what you could do with a government who has billions of dollars and won't say a word when you lose it all. They'll keep it as quiet as they possibly can, like my city of Lethbridge did, like the Alberta government did when the Treasury branch lost a billion dollars, like they all do. Um, I had one other thought there, and it escaped my mind, so I'll carry on. And I'll say the third thing I promised you I was going to tell you was you really can't do anything about this until you become aware. And you become aware and you share this information with other people and that seems to be something that's happening around the world now. And people are speaking up saying, well, we're not going to take it anymore. Right now, it's like the uh, slide at the very beginning of this presentation, which was the happy face fraud versus theft. With fraud, you don't know what's happened to you. So you just put up with it. There's where most people are. In Canada, they're saying, no, 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 none of this stuff can happen in Canada. We are extremely safe, we're well regulated, we're way safer than the Americans. And it is just not the case. I've had 54 minutes of your time, and I appreciate it a great deal. I hope you've learned something here, and I hope you'll look at my websites and join me on Facebook, as some of you have. And spread this information out there so that you, your family, your children, and your children's children are not victims of people who do not have to follow the same laws that you guys have to follow. Thank you very much for giving me your time and attention. I appreciate it.